Love, a very complex and powerful thing. Do you think neuroscientists have it figured out? Keep listening on to find out, only here on the People Scientist Podcast. listening to The People Scientist, the podcast dedicated to helping us optimize our health with the latest scientific findings on neuroscience, physiology, and nutrition. I, your host, Dr. Stephanie Caligiuri, a nutritionist, physiologist, and neuroscientist, will be here with you every single week, bringing us information to ignite our thinking, to help us be one step closer to the healthiest we can be. Hello, my People Scientist Army, and welcome back to the People Scientist Podcast for episode 91, where every week I arm us with some scientific evidence so that we can all be a little bit smarter and healthier with every episode. Wherever and whenever you are listening, I hope you are doing well and that your day is going better than you expected. I hope that today's episode can add a little bit of joy to your day. Today's episode is an interest piece. With Valentine's Day around the corner, I wanted to do an episode on this topic and share some neuroscience on the subject of love and bonding. Love can be our greatest inspiration, our muse, our motivation, and therefore love is a very powerful thing. Because love is such a powerful feeling, Many psychologists and neuroscientists have wanted to study it. So let's have a fun little episode talking about the science of love. I think you might just learn some new and interesting things in today's episode. So as we always do, let's start off with some core takeaways. Love, this powerful being that can light our souls on fire that can be our muse for some of the greatest works of art and music, and for some, their entire reason for existing. How on earth do we define such a complex thing? Well, some have defined love as feelings of intense affection, desire, attachment, bonding, and pleasure. Does our brain regulate or influence these feelings of love? Yes, it appears it might. It is thought that certain molecules in our brain can influence our feelings of attachment, our social behavior, our emotions, affection, and trust. This includes molecules like oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, cortisol, and testosterone. We also have brain regions that are thought to regulate our emotions like happiness, joy, or the opposite like fear and sadness. We also have brain regions that regulate our feelings of reward and pleasure like our brain reward pathway. All these brain regions seem to be involved in falling in love. There appears to be three phases of love, according to psychologists, and these molecules and brain regions that I just mentioned seem to regulate these three phases of love. But is love purely a chemical or scientific thing? That is up to you to decide. Now, let's get into those details. Years ago, scientists studied love as a way to promote stability within marriages and families. They originally thought that with more conflict in a relationship, that that meant there was less love, that conflict was the enemy to love. But psychologists since then have disproven this. Houston in 2001 reported that the greatest predictor of love and a successful romantic relationship seems to instead be signs of positive affect, like enhanced eye contact, cuddling, positive remarks about each other, etc. These are signs of affection, admiration, and bonding, which can be foundational in a romantic relationship, and seem to be the biggest predictors of a successful romantic relationship, but not always. Psychologists speculate that there are three phases of love. The first phase they have coined as being in love. It's kind of a funny title, but they simply just called this phase number one, 
being in love. It is characterized by a rise in stress hormones, actually, in the blood, like cortisol and vasopressin, but also a rise in dopamine brain region activity. And that is because this first phase of love is a time of uncertainty, but as well a time of euphoria, excitement, and intimacy. This phase is thought to last around six months, approximately. Now the next phase, the second phase of love, has been called passionate love. The feelings of excitement and euphoria decline a little bit and now are replaced with stability and balance. Levels of intimacy and commitment can also increase during this phase. The stress hormones that were higher during that first six months, that phase one of being in love, have now dropped. This phase tends to last around a few years, but some couples can remain in this phase for a very long time. The third phase is the phase where many couples may break up. This tends to happen around the four-year mark, so some psychologists have said that the seven-year itch where couples tend to drift apart actually tends to happen earlier, and they have now coined it the four-year itch. This third phase of love, if couples make it this far, is called companionate love. This phase is quite similar to friendship, where passion declines, but intimacy and commitment remain high. The molecule oxytocin that is produced in our brain, is thought to be the main hormone or neuropeptide involved here, which is involved in bonding and attachment and trust. And if commitment is high enough between two people, then the relationship can successfully last in this phase. So I mentioned here in this final phase of love, oxytocin. And this is the most talked about hormone in the context of love and bonding. Oxytocin is produced in our brain, And it can act on many different brain regions, including on our brain reward pathway that regulates our feelings of pleasure and reward. I think the study that really sensationalized oxytocin as the love hormone was the study conducted by Scheele in 2013 in the journal PNAS. The scientists recruited 20 heterosexual monogamous couples. The scientists' goal was to determine if providing oxytocin via a nasal spray if that could enhance romantic feelings and activity of certain pleasure brain regions. Now, it is known that a nasal spray containing oxytocin is an effective way of quickly increasing circulating oxytocin levels. Now, this study was a double-blinded, placebo-controlled crossover study, so a well-designed study. What the scientists did was they had the men in all of the couples use the nasal spray, And specifically, they were asked to take three puffs of the nasal spray in each nostril. Now, the spray either contained oxytocin or just salt as the placebo. The men waited 30 minutes after the nasal spray, and then they were shown pictures of faces of different women, including their partner, women they knew, and women they did not know. Now, oxytocin treatment made the men perceive their partner's face as more attractive versus when they were treated with the placebo spray. The oxytocin spray, interestingly, did not make the men perceive the other women as more attractive, whether they knew the women or not. It only made them more attractive to their partners' faces. In addition, the scientists measured the recruitment of different brain regions using fMRI while this task was happening. And interestingly, the pleasure and reward centers of the men's brains had a stronger signal when looking at their partner's face after oxytocin treatment versus the placebo treatment. So the scientists concluded that the oxytocin nasal spray may have enhanced romantic feelings, attractive observation toward their partner, and monogamy in men, as oxytocin only increased thoughts of attractiveness and enhanced the signal in reward brain regions specific to their partner and no one else. As a result, oxytocin has been looked at as a molecule that can enhance monogamy, bonding, and thoughts of attractiveness. Further, Bakerman's in 2013, in the journal Translational Psychiatry, conducted a meta-analysis that pooled together several clinical trials to understand if oxytocin nasal spray could influence social behavior in humans. And in healthy participants, it appeared that the oxytocin nasal spray increased feelings of trust and made people better at recognizing different emotions by looking at faces of people. 
Overall, clinical studies in humans, even with just one single dose of oxytocin, typically 30 minutes following the oxytocin nasal spray, seem to have some effects on behavior in specific psychology tasks. For example, an oxytocin nasal spray seemed to enhance interpersonal trust and cooperation. It increased feelings of generosity, social recognition memory, social reinforcement learning and empathy, and enhanced people's ability to assess facial attractiveness and trustworthiness. So really intriguingly, a nasal spray of oxytocin seemed to enhance social interaction and fundamentals involved in relationship building, like trust and cooperation. But on the other hand, it is important to note that a few studies noted that the oxytocin nasal spray may have also enhanced some negative feelings, like increasing feelings of envy and gloating and prejudice. So it is thought that oxytocin may enhance social emotions, whether they be positive or negative but most of the clinical trial data seems to indicate that oxytocin enhances more so the positive feelings. Now, oxytocin also interacts with our brain reward pathway in order to release dopamine, making love or relationships a rewarding experience. This dopamine brain reward pathway also happens to be involved in addiction, as things like sugar, nicotine, alcohol, and some illicit drugs can activate this pathway too. In many ways, love can feel like an addiction, and the dopamine pathways that are involved in love and bonding are largely similar to those that are involved in addictive behavior. Now, remember in past episodes, I've mentioned how our brain reinforces and makes pleasurable what it thinks we need to survive. Unless, of course, in the case of illicit drugs, which hijack this system, But bonding with others is necessary for our survival and for carrying on the human race. So this is made to feel rewarding and reinforcing by releasing dopamine in our brain reward pathway. Zeki in 2007 concluded that using fMRI studies in humans, brain areas that show activation in romantic love include the medial insula, the anterior cingulate cortex, the hippocampus, striatum, nucleus accumbens, and the hypothalamus of our brain. These areas that I just mentioned are important components of that brain reward system and all contain high concentrations of dopamine. But at the same time, several cortical regions, including the amygdala, the frontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex, the temporal poles, are inhibited in individuals that are newly fallen in love. Interesting, isn't it? That could potentially explain why some have said that love is blind, or love makes us do stupid things. That's because our thinking, decision-making, memory brain regions seem to be less active or inhibited in people that are newly in love, whereas the pleasure and reward brain regions are more active when newly in love. The neurobiology helps explain some behavior when people are newly in love, doesn't it? What else might influence our feelings of love? Our genetics just might. I have mentioned the molecule serotonin in past episodes. Serotonin is really important for our positive and stable mood. Unfortunately, many individuals diagnosed with major depressive disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, or generalized anxiety are thought to potentially have lower levels of active serotonin in the brain. Some individuals are born with a slight difference and their genetic coding for a specific serotonin receptor. This specific genetic difference was recently linked to an obsessive romantic attachment behavior. This information also suggests that serotonin is an important factor in the obsessive component of romantic love, and that our genetics just might regulate our bonding and relationships. If you are interested to see if you have this genetic difference, I believe there are some companies out there that will do genetic testing. I personally haven't done this for myself, but it could be an interesting experience to learn what your genetic differences might be. And this specific gene that was involved or shown to be associated with an obsession with romantic love was 5-HT2A. What else might influence our feelings of love and relationships? Well, testosterone is another. 
testosterone rises when we sleep. So individuals with poor sleep may be more likely to have lower testosterone. I spoke about this at length in episode 16. Now, testosterone is a steroid hormone, which is secreted by the testes of males and the ovaries of females. So yes, women also have testosterone. Testosterone is involved in several aspects of social behavior, including social aggression and intimacy. But testosterone seems to also play a role in romantic love and bonding. In a clinical trial by Marazidi in 2004, scientists recruited individuals who recently fell in love and measured levels of testosterone and compared this versus single individuals not in love. The scientists noted that single men had higher levels of circulating testosterone versus men in a new relationship. Interestingly, the opposite was true for women. Women at the beginning of a new relationship had higher levels of testosterone versus single women. However, these differences between those in a new relationship versus those who are single, those differences seem to fade after about one to two years, suggesting that testosterone is involved in the earlier phases of romantic love. So sex hormones like testosterone seem to play an important role in relationships and romance. Now how about female sex hormones? It is thought that when a woman or a female animal is in their estrus phase, when estrogen is high and progesterone is low, that the woman or the female animal is more open to social interaction and bonding with a partner. This could be because during this estrus time, the woman or female animal is able to become pregnant. So there seems to be a survival or logical explanation for this. However, when progesterone levels rise, like during the premenstrual or the luteal phase, the animal or the woman may appear to be less open to bonding and less open to social interaction. However, women on oral contraceptives would have lower levels of these endogenous hormones like estrogen and progesterone and therefore are less likely to be influenced by these fluctuating levels of estrogen and progesterone. So that is a wrap, my people, scientist army, for episode 91, the neuroscience of love. Many molecules and brain regions seem to be involved in affection and bonding. Oxytocin is a neuropeptide to highlight, as nasal spray treatment with oxytocin seems to increase feelings of trust, admiration, attractiveness, bonding, and feeling of monogamy. Testosterone also seems to be important in the beginning of relationships, and seems to have opposite responses in men and women. Progesterone and estrogen in women who are not taking oral contraceptives may also modulate their openness for social interaction and bonding in the beginning of a new relationship. Our genetics may also play a role, as specific genetic differences for a serotonin receptor in some individuals was associated with an obsession with romantic love. Now, being in love can feel addictive, as being in love has similar effects on our brain reward pathway, just like other rewarding things like sugar and alcohol. This rewarding effect may decline with time in a relationship and may be replaced with companionate love, characterized by commitment and intimacy. These feelings of bonding seem to be dependent upon oxytocin in our brain. So what do you think? Is love purely a chemical or scientific thing? It is completely up to you to decide. So I hope that this special Valentine's Day episode was interesting for all of you. If you enjoy the show, then please take a moment to leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or send me a message to let me know what you thought of it or even feel free to buy me a coffee. The details on how to do that are in the description box to this episode. If you don't already follow me on social media, make sure to do that as that is where I like to post extra information and some of the studies that I mention in every week's episode. So I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I will catch you all next week, the same time and same place, on the People Scientist Podcast. Bye for now. I am a scientist simply sharing scientific evidence. Some of the clinical interventions I discuss are not appropriate for everyone. Before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle, please do consult the advice of your physician or dietitian. My opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of Mount Sinai Hospital and its affiliates.